morning connecting point or afternoon, whatever. It's probably morning, sure. Um, so here we are. We're going to finish our talk on Samson and talk about the last chapter of his life there, or the last, yeah, that describes his life. Last week we looked at the uh, societal conditions that existed when Samson was born. We also saw that he lived his life with a complete disregard for what was right. He not only commits sin, but it becomes a game to him to trap others. Today we will look at the final chapter of his biography. Judges chapter 16 contains one of the best known stories of the Old Testament. The story of Samson and Deliah. If you grew up in the church, you were probably told this story in Sunday school. I guess the story of a man with great strength is a fun one to tell children. Perhaps it's slightly more palatable than Ehud losing his sword in a man's belly fat. Um, I know last week I didn't spend much time reading the passage, and there was a lot to read, so uh, I'll make up for it this week and we'll read the entire chapter eventually. So, sit down and strap in, right? Okay, so let's start. Chapter 16. Uh, one day, Samson went up to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went to spend the whole night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. And they made no move during the night, saying, At dawn, we will kill him. But Samson lay there until only the middle of the night. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the posts, the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So that was a quick little story. Samson sees a prostitute and thinks it's a good idea to spend the night with her. We are told that he went to Gaza to find her. Now looking at the geography of the area, Gaza is well inside the Philistine territory. He was not simply sneaking in for a one night stand. He was walking almost the entire length of the territory to get to his lady. This is not a casual slip up, but an intentional act of rebellion on his part. He was noticed by everyone as he walked, and everyone saw him coming. Usually seeing a prostitute is a discreet event, but not for Samson. He is seeking sin and seeking to provoke the Philistines. Okay, he knows they are out there to get him. Despite that fact, after he is done with the woman, he goes to the city gates and rips the doors and posts right out of the city wall. That is an amazing feat by itself, but he carries the gate up the hill near Hebron, which is 40 miles away. Not much is said, or nothing at all is said about why he did this. Perhaps it was an act of self-preservation, knowing that men were waiting to kill him. After all, would you go after a man that's carrying city gates on his shoulders? And again, his actions have not saved any Israelites. He has only saved his own hide. Now we finally meet Delilah. There are four women mentioned in Samson's life, and Delilah is the only one whose name is actually mentioned. Her name means night which may be a bit of a foreshadow. You may remember that Samson means little sun, and he is about to meet his end in the darkness brought about by the night. We do not know if she's a Philistine or an Israelite, but given his penchant for Philistine women, it seems very probable that she was of that nationality. So this story starts in verse 4. After this, he, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, and see where his great strength lies, and how we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. Then we will give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. Um... Now we see for the second time, Samson's lover is pressured to find out the secret about Samson. Last week we talked about his first wife and his riddle. You may remember that hers was a life or death struggle. The Philistines threatened to kill her if she did not do what they asked. So I can see that, so I can see that may have been quite a stressful time for her. Here in this story, Delilah is offered money. 
She was offered 1,100 pieces of silver from each of the lords. We're not sure what motivated the leaders, but it may have something to do with the fact that he just tore down their city gates. If he is strong enough to do that, he remains a threat to them all. Through all of this, we can be sure of Delilah's motivation. Can commentators believe that the money offered may have been over 500 times the average annual wage. And I think many people would change their allegiances for that kind of money. Delilah seems to have no problem with it and starts to ask where Samson gets his strength. Now this brings us to an interesting point. Samson's strength was a mystery. He is often, often portrayed as a meathead with bulging muscles. I suspect that is not true in this case. Now I have here a picture of Hathor Julius Bjornsson from Iceland. He is six foot nine. That's one inch taller than me. He weighs 205 kilograms, uh, which is almost twice my weight. He recently retired, but he was competing in the World's Strongest Men competitions. In this picture, he is setting a record at that time for lifting 501 kilograms. That's 1,100 pounds. Now I'm going to suggest if Samson looked like this, there would be no confusion as to the source of his strength. It is obvious Thor is a superhuman who worked very hard to get that way. This is not the case with Samson. They cannot figure it out. How can this scrawny man do these great, great feats of strength? Uh, one little rabbit trail. Thor's wife is five foot two. Can you imagine how funny it must look to be 19 inches taller than your wife? Discuss amongst yourselves, can you picture a scrawny Samson? Does the thought of a small, thin Samson agree with your imagination? Share your thoughts on this concept. Okay, so back to our story at verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength is, and how you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and become like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh cords that had not been dried, and she bound him up with them. And she, had seven, and she had men lying in wait in an inner room, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as a string of tow snaps when it touches fire. So his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have deceived me and told me lies. Now please tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me tightly with new ropes, which have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. For the men were lying in wait in the inner room, but he snapped the ropes from his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, Up to now you have deceived me and told me lies. Tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my hair, with the web and fasten it with a pin, then I shall become weak like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the web, and she fastened it with a pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the pin of the loom and the web. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me these three times, have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. So he told her all that was in his heart, and he said to her, A razor has never come on my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will, be, will leave me and be like any other man. He is so annoyed by her persistence that he tells her that his hair is part of a Nazarite vow and the source of his strength. Delilah then calls in a barber who is able to shave his head while Samson sleeps. Now honestly, if I'm asleep and Tracy touches the doorknob, I wake up. 
So I don't understand how someone's head can be shaved while they're sleeping. Um, but that's neither here nor there. So, once the haircut is complete, the Philistines gouge out his eyes and put him on the grain mill to make their grits for breakfast. From the start of this sequence, he is playing a game, much like at his wedding. His toys with, he toys with Delilah when he tells her that ropes will stop him. Over time, he gets confident and complacent. The third time, he mentions his hair getting dangerously close to the truth. Finally, he tells her of his vow, and if his hair were shaved, his strength would be gone. He played with fire, and he got burnt. Such is the way of sin. When we get too complacent, we get burnt. It is best to run away from the crouching tiger, just as God advised Cain in Genesis chapter 4. Samson's strength is not, was not in his hair per se, but it comes from God alone who granted it to him. His hair is simply a representation of God working through Samson, uh, through his predestined Nazarite vow to be set apart for God's use. This also shows that he was well aware of his vow, and all his previous actions seem even more defiant in this light. You may have noticed Delilah made her intent very clear from the start. Her first three requests stated that she wanted to tie him up. The first time, she even said that she wants to tie him up and afflict him. Three times she had men waiting to take him away. Yet Samson missed her warnings. She finally questions his devotion and love for her while making her fourth request, and that seemed to be the breaking point. He was so controlled by his physical passions that his common sense left the room. Now that Samson has been tied up, the Philistines take him and gouge out his eyes. Samson can no longer do what is right in his own eyes. He has been cured of that for good. That looks like a good warning to us all. Our motivations and our darkness will be our undoing if not dealt with. There is no escaping that. Our text continues, The Lord of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god. For they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has given into our hands even the destroyer of our country, who has slain many of us. You can see their focus on themselves in this passage. They think they have accomplished something, something great when in fact it was orchestrated by God's hand. The Philistines are so full of themselves that they have a giant party in their temple and bring in Samson to entertain them. Samson calls on God for the first time in his life and his plea continues to be self-serving. Watch what he says and how focused he is on himself. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might, so that the house fell on the Lord's, and all the people who were in it, so the dead that he killed at his death, were more than those whom he killed in his life. So here we are at the death of Samson, and he remains focused on himself right to the end. His epithet is he accomplished more in his death than when he was alive. What a dark summary of one's life. Here we are 3,000 years later talking about his failure. He did not free a single Israelite from their oppression. The case could be made that he weakened the foe by destroying their crops, killing their leaders, and tearing down one of their temples. At best, this sets the table for someone else to come in and do the work to end the oppression. And again, we also find in verse 6 of the next chapter, chapter 17, that famous phrase, And every man did what was right in his own eyes. We have been using this as a summary statement for our study for the book of Judges. We have watched a steady decline from Joshua, one of the best examples of leadership in the Bible, to Samson, a leader with no achievements to look up to, and a legacy of selfishness. What do we learn from Samson? 
We have several clear clues that help us. We have discussed the fact that God remains faithful and still saves people, even without any effort on our part. He initiates salvation. He gives us grace. He even gives us the faith that allows us to believe. He is the source of all salvation. Now Samson was called to be er, yeah, Samson was called to be used by God to free Israel. Through all his bumbling and stumbling, he became an unwitting participant. God used him despite his selfishness and pursued a woman. I want to remind us of verse 5 in chapter 13. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mother, he stated that their son would begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Samson's life starts a series of events that occur over the next 100 years that I believe culminates with the dedication of Solomon's temple. From Samson's time, Israel fights a constant battle with the Philistines. The victories go back and forth. Israel declares a king, and Saul is anointed. He has some success, but does not complete the job. During Saul's reign, David appears. He has a few triumphant moments, but, it, but this turns Saul against him. Saul goes mad in his desire to snuff out David and ends his reign when he's killed in battle with the, with the Philistines. At this point, Israel is still not completely delivered from the Philistines. Now anointed king, David has to fight hard. Finally, after many battles, 2 Samuel tells us that the Lord had given David rest on every side from all his enemies. Even then, it was, it was David's son, Solomon, when he became king, he built the temple. Due to the reputation of David and Solomon's great wisdom, the nations surrounding them had great respect for Israel. They were the world's superpower at this time. They were the, at their largest land mass and wealth. In fact, the Bible says that they received 4,800 pounds of gold from the other nations so that silver and that silver was so plentiful that it was considered worthless. In a hundred years, the nation went from every man for himself, complete with oppression and slavery, to a national focus on the presence of God, which resulted in peace and comfort. This is a big swing in the heart of the nation. So I have a handful of points I want to draw out. I can't lift up Samson as an example of how to live our daily lives, but there are clues that will help us understand our place. The first point I want to draw out comes from the statement, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. It is used when Samson kills the lion, when he kills 30 men for their clothes, and when he kills 1,000 men with the, the jawbone. Later, when Delilah cuts his hair, it says the Spirit of the Lord had left him. This phrase is also used with Othniel and Gideon and a handful of others throughout the Old Testament. Now this indwelling of the Spirit appears to be a temporary condition. In the Old Testament, the Spirit was given when needed. Now that changed on the day of Pentecost, when the promised Helper was given to every believer. From that day on, the Spirit took up permanent residence in every believer's heart. Romans 8.11 tells us so. Moreover, if the Spirit of the One who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his spirit who lives in you. Now stop and think about the significance of that statement. The strength it takes to raise someone from the dead is far beyond what you and I can do. It is far beyond the realm of science. It is only the power of God that can overcome that finality. And that leads to the second point that I want to make, the concept of our strength. I talked about the fact that Samson's strength was not evident to those around him. His enemies could not see any reason for it and pressed quite hard to find out his secret. To me, this is a great picture for 2 Corinthians 12.9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In this passage, Paul is talking about all his accomplishments. He mentions how smart he is, how good he is at rhetoric. He brags about how much revelation he has received directly from God, even about his toughness through beatings and whippings. Paul has an impressive resume, and through it all he recognizes that God has sent, sent something to torment him in, in order to ensure Paul sees his own weakness. He recognizes that the secret to his strength is the Spirit 
of him who raised Christ from the dead. It's not visible to the world, it resides in him. He's also arguing that oppression or persecution and affliction will come in our own lives and that our strength comes from God alone. Now let's look at how all this relates to us. As believers, we have that powerful spirit living inside all of us. He has taken up permanent residence. He will remind us of our weakness and that our strength comes from him alone. The big questions are, what do we do with this? Where do we direct this strength? Why has he given it to us? A few weeks ago, at the beginning of our study, we discussed Judges chapter 2 and 3. We discussed the monotonous cycle of how the people of God would forget to serve God and make awful choices. This would lead to oppression, which led to the people to cry out to God, which led to his salvation, which would lead to comfort, which led to bad choices again, and so on and so on. In fact, God states that he left opposing nations to test the faithfulness of Israel. God said that he God said that he left the opposing nations so Israel would learn how to conduct a holy war. Now I'm not going to go into the depth of what a holy war is. Doug, Doug touched on that back in chapter, uh, when we talked about chapter 2. So, um, and I know that idea of a holy war is a stumbling block for many who are not in the faith. And I get it. Um, in the books of Joshua and Dodges talk about killing other nations, genocide if you will. And I'm not sure I'm verse, well enough versed to defend it, but I do know that what happened in physical words in their time is a picture for us for what happens in the spiritual realm in our day. The stories teach us that evil remains so that we will learn how to fight spiritual battles. The Spirit indwells us so we can fight these battles. The strength is available in our weakness so we can stand firm in what we believe. We are here, and our purpose in life is to mitigate the horrible effects of sin. One way of doing that is to fight. We have been given armor as a defense, as described in Ephesians chapter 6. We have, been given, we have been given offensive weapons to move forward and make advances through the oppression of the enemy. I believe that among these offensive weapons is our worship, as seen in the Battle of Jericho. We have been promised of that power, of the, its power. Another is our weakness and reliance in God, as the Spirit of God comes upon us. Finally, our humility and repentance is mighty. Second Chronicles 7.14 tells us, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. So what I read here is that when his people pray, seek him and repent, God heals the land. We no, have to, we no longer have to argue ad infinitum to convince others that they are wrong. We no longer have to show we are right. If we turn to God, he will heal the land. I truly believe we may be at one of those moments in history where the people of God have the opportunity to turn to him and we'll be able to watch evil destroy itself. When it does so, others will reject sin and turn to God. I feel that the time is near for our repentance and turning. When that happens, there will be opportunity for, help, for us to help others to find God. All the more reason for us to be ready with a clean heart when that time arrives. And then we can grab the hands of those seeking the truth and point them to Jesus. Okay, so I want to leave you with this final table talk. And it's just kind of discussing the concepts that I've talked about. So discuss, choose one or choose them all, just the idea of the Spirit living in us. Or God's strength is, is shown in our weakness. Or fighting battles with prayer or worship or repentance or seeking God. So thank you very much for listening and have a good week and pray for each other in Jesus' name.